Chapter 2 Around the Campfire The low mound of coals throbbed like the heart of some giant beast. Occasionally, a patch of gold sparks flared into existence and raced across the surface of the wood before vanishing into a white-hot crevice. The dying remnants of the fire Aragon and Roran had built cast a dim red light over the surrounding area, revealing a patch of rocky soil, a few pewter gray bushes, and the indistinct mass of a juniper tree farther off, then nothing. Aragon sat with his bare feet extended toward the nest of ruby embers, enjoying the warmth, and with his back propped against the knobby scales of Saphira's thick right foreleg. Opposite him, Roran was perched on the iron-hard, sun-bleached, wind-worn shell of an ancient tree trunk. Every time he moved, the trunk produced a bitter shriek that made Aragon want to claw at his ears. For the moment, quiet reigned within the hollow. Even the coals smoldered in silence. Roran had collected only long dead book branches devoid of moisture to eliminate any smoke that unfriendly eyes might spot. Aragon had just finished recounting the day's activities to Sephira. Normally, he never had to tell her what he had been doing, as thoughts, feelings, and other sensations flowed between them as easily as water from one side of a lake to another. But in this instance, it was necessary because Aragon had kept his mind carefully shielded during the scouting up the expedition, aside from his disembodied foray into the Razak's lair. After a considerable gap in the conversation, Sephira yawned, exposing her rows of many fearsome teeth. Cruel and evil they may be, but I am impressed that the Razak can bewitch their prey into wanting to be eaten. They are great hunters to do that. Perhaps I shall attempt it some day. But not... Aragon felt compelled to add, with people. Try it with sheep instead. People, sheep, what difference is there to a dragon? Then she laughed deep in her long throat, a rolling rumble that reminded him of thunder. Leaning forward to take his weight off Saphir's sharp-edged scales, Aragon picked up the hawthorn staff that lay by his side. He rolled it between his palms, admiring the play of light over the polished tangle of roots at the top, and the much-scratched metal ferrule and spike at the base. Roran had thrust the staff into his arms before they left the Varden on the burning plains, saying, Here, Fisk made this for me after the Razak bit my shoulder. I know you lost your sword, and I thought you might have need of it. If you want to get another blade, that's fine too, but I've found there are very few fights you can't win with a few whacks from a good, strong stick. Remembering the staff Brom had always carried, Aragon had decided to forego a new sword in favor of the length of knotted hawthorn. After losing Zorak, he felt no desire to take up another, lesser sword. That night, he had fortified both the knotted hawthorn and the handle of Roran's hammer with several spells that would prevent either piece from breaking, except under the most extreme stress. Unbidden, a series of memories overwhelmed Aragon. A sullen orange and crimson sky swirled around him, as Sephira dove in pursuit of the red dragon and his rider, wind howled past his ears. His fingers went numb from the jolt of sword striking sword as he dueled that same rider on the ground. Tearing off his foe's helm in the middle of combat to reveal his once friend and traveling companion, Murtag, whom he had thought dead. The sneer upon Murtag's face as he took Zorak from Aragon, claiming the red sword by right of inheritance as Aragon's elder brother. Aragon blinked, disoriented as the noise and fury of battle faded, and the pleasant aroma of juniper wood replaced the stench of blood. He ran his tongue over his upper teeth, trying to eradicate the taste of bile that filled his mouth. Murtag. The name alone generated a welter of confused emotions in Aragon. On one hand, he liked Murtag. Murtag had saved Aragon and Sephira from the Razak after the first ill-fated visit to Drasleona risked his life to help extricate Aragon from Gilead, acquitted himself honorably in the Battle of Farthander, and, despite the torments he no doubt endured as a result, had chosen to interpret his orders from Galvatorix in a way that allowed him to release Aragon and Sephira after the Battle of the Burning Plains instead of taking them captive. It was not Murtag's fault that the twins had abducted him, that the red dragon, Thorn, had hatched for him, or that Galvatorix had discovered their true names with which he extracted oaths of fealty in the ancient language from both Murtag and Thorn. None of that could be blamed on Murtag. He was a victim of fate, and had been since the day he was born. 
And yet, Murtag might serve Galvatorix against his will, and he might abhor the atrocities the king forced him to commit, but some part of him seemed to revel in wielding his newfound power. During the recent engagement between the Varden and the Empire on the Burning Plains, Murtag had singled out the Dwarf King, Hrothgar, and slain him, although Galvatorix had not ordered Murtag to do so. He had let Aragon and Saphir go, yes, but only after defeating them in a brutal contest, contest of strength, and then listening to Aragon plead for their freedom. And Murtag had derived entirely too much pleasure from the anguish he inflicted upon Aragon by revealing they were both sons of Morzan, the first and last of the thirteen dragon riders, the Forsworn, who had betrayed their compatriots to Galvatorix. Now, four days after the battle, another explanation presented itself to Aragon. Perhaps what Murtag enjoyed was watching another person shoulder the same terrible burden he had carried his whole life. Whether or not that was true, Aragorn suspected Murtag had embraced his new role for the same reason that a dog who has been whipped without cause will some day turn and attack his master. Murtag had been whipped and whipped, and now he had his chance to strike back at a world that had shown him little enough kindness. Yet no matter what good might still flicker in Murtag's breast, he and Aragon were doomed to be mortal enemies, for Murtag's promises in the ancient language bound him to Galvatorix with unbreakable fetters and would forevermore. If only he hadn't gone with Ajahad to hunt the Urgles underneath Farthendur, or for I had been just a little faster, the twins. Aragon, said Sephira. He caught himself and nodded, grateful for her intervention. Aragon did his best to avoid brooding upon Murtag or their shared parents but such thoughts often waylaid him when he least expected it. Drawing and releasing a slow breath to clear his head, Aragon tried to force his mind back to the present, but could not. The morning after the massive battle on the Burning Plains, when the Varden were busy regrouping and preparing to march after the Empire's army, which had retreated several leagues up the Giet River, Aragon had gone to Nosueda and Arya, explained Roran's predicament, and sought their permission to help his cousin. He did not succeed, both women vehemently opposed what Nasweda described as a harebrained scheme that will have catastrophic consequences for everyone in Alagasia if it goes awry. The debate raged on for so long, at last Safira had interrupted with a roar that shook the walls of the command tent. Then, she said, I am sore and tired, and Aragon is doing a poor job of explaining himself. We have better things to do than stand around yammering like jackdaws, no? Good, now listen to me. It was, reflected Aragon, difficult to argue with a dragon. The details of Saphira's remarks were complex, but the underlying structure of her presentation was straightforward. Saphira supported Aragon because she understood how much the proposed mission meant to him, while Aragon supported Roran because of love and family, and because he knew Roran would pursue Katrina with or without him, and his cousin would never be able to defeat the Razak by himself. Also, so long as the Empire held Katrina captive, Roran, and through him, Aragon, was vulnerable to manipulation by Galvatorix. If the usurper d d threatened to kill Katrina, Roran would have no choice but to submit to his demands. It would be best, then, to patch this breach in their defenses before their enemies took advantage of it. As for the timing, it was perfect. Neither Galvatorix nor the Razak would expect a raid in the center of the Empire, when the Varden were busy fighting Galvatorix's troops near the border, border of Serta. Murtag and Thorn had been seen flying toward Urubane, no doubt to be chastised in person. And Nasueda and Arya agreed with Aragon that those two would probably then continue northward to confront Queen Azanzadi and the army under her command once the elves made their first strike and revealed their presence. And if possible, it would be good to eliminate the Razak before they started to terrorize and demoralize the Varden's warriors. Safira had then pointed out, in the most diplomatic of terms, that if Nasueda asserted her authority as Aragon's liege lord and forbade him from p participating in the sortie, it would poison their relationship with the sort of rancor and dissent that could undermine the Varden's cause. But, said Safira, the choice is yours. Keep Aragon here if you want. However, his commitments are not mine, and I, for one, have decided to accompany Roran. It seems like a fine adventure. A faint smile touched Aragon's lips as he recalled the scene. 
The combined weight of Safira's declaration and her impregnable logic had convinced Nasueda and Arya to grant their approval, albeit grudgingly. Afterward, Nasueda had said, We are trusting your judgment in this, Aragon, Safira, for your sake and ours. I hope this expedition goes well. Her tone left Aragon uncertain whether her words represented a heartfelt wish or a subtle threat. Aragon had spent the rest of that day gathering supplies, studying maps of the Empire with Sephira, and casting what spells he felt were necessary, such as one to thwart attempts by Galvatorix or his minions to scry Rorin. The following morning, Aragon and Rorin had climbed onto Sephira's back, and she had taken flight, rising above the orange clouds that stifled the burning plains and angling northeast. She flew non-stop until the sun had traversed the dome of the sky and extinguished itself behind the horizon and then burst forth again with a glorious conflagration of reds and yellows. The first leg of their journey carried them toward the edge of the empire, which few people inhabited. From there they turned west toward Drosleona and Helgrind. Then on, they traveled at night to avoid notice by anyone in the many small villages scattered across the grasslands that lay between them and their destination. Aragon and Rorin had to swathe themselves in cloaks and furs and woolen mittens and felted hats, for Sephira chose to fly higher than the ice-bound peaks of most mountains, where the air was thin and dry and stabbed at their lungs, so that if a farmer tending a sick calf in the field, or a sharp-eyed watchman making his rounds, should happen to look up as she passed overhead, Sephira would appear no larger than an eagle. Everywhere they went, Aragon saw evidence of the war that was now afoot. Camps of soldiers, wagons full of supplies gathered into a bunch for the night, and lines of men with iron collars, being led from their homes to fight on Galvatorix's behalf. The amount of resources deployed against them was daunting in indeed. Near the end of the second night, Helgrind had appeared in the distance, a mass of splintered columns, vague and ominous in the ashen light that precedes dawn. Sephira had landed in the hollow where they were now, and they had slept through most of the past day before beginning their reconnaissance. A fountain of amber motes billowed and swirled as Rorin tossed a branch onto the disintegrating coals. He caught Aragon's look and shrugged. Cold, he said. Before Aragon could respond, he heard a slithering, scraping sound akin to someone drawing a sword. He did not think. He flung himself in the opposite direction, rolled once, and came up in a crouch, lifting the hawthorn staff to deflect an oncoming blow. Rorin was nearly as fast. He grabbed his shield from the ground scrambled back from the log he had been sitting on, and drew his hammer from his belt, all in the span of a few seconds. They froze, waiting for the attack. Aragon's heart pounded, and his muscles trembled as he searched the darkness for the slightest hint of motion. "'I smell nothing,' said Sephira. When several minutes elapsed without incident, Aragon pushed his mind out over the surrounding landscape. "'No one,' he said." Reaching deep within himself to the place where he could touch the flow of magic, he uttered the words, Brzinger rod her! A pale red ware light popped into existence several feet in front of him and remained there, floating at eye level and painting the hollow with a watery radiance. He moved slightly, and the ware light mimicked his motion, as if connected to him by an invisible pole. Together, he and Rorin advanced toward where they'd heard the sound, down the gulch that wound eastward. They held their weapons high and paused between each step, ready to defend themselves at any moment. About ten yards from their camp, Rorin held up a hand, stopping Aragon, then pointed at a plate of shale that lay on top of the grass. It appeared conspicuously out of place. Kneeling, Rorin rubbed a smaller fragment of shale across the plate and created the same steely scrape they had heard before. It must have fallen, said Aragon, examining the sides of the gulch. He allowed the wear light to fade into oblivion. Rorin nodded and stood, brushing dirt from his pants. As he walked back to Sephira, Aragon considered the speed with which they had reacted. His heart still contracted into a hard, painful knot with each beat. His hands shook, and he felt like dashing into the wilderness and running several miles without stopping. We wouldn't have jumped like that before, he thought. The reason for their vigilance was no mystery. Every one of their fights had chipped away at their complacency, leaving behind nothing but raw nerves that twitched at the slightest touch. Rorin must have been entertaining similar thoughts, for he said, 
Do you see them? Who? The men you've killed. Do you see them in your dreams? Sometimes. The pulsing glow from the coals lit Roran's face from below, forming thick shadows above his mouth and across his forehead, and giving his heavy, half-lidded eyes a baleful aspect. He spoke slowly, as if he found the, found the words difficult. I never wanted to be a warrior. I dreamed of blood and glory when I was younger, as every boy does, but the land was what was important to me, that and our family. And now I have killed. I have killed and killed, and you have killed even more. His gaze focused on some distant place only he could see. There were these two men in Narda. Did I tell you this before? He had, but Aragorn shook his head and remained silent. They were guards at the main gate, two of them, you know, and the man on the right, he had pure white hair. I remember because he couldn't have been more than twenty-four, twenty-five. They wore Galbatorix's sigil, but spoke as if they were from Narda. They weren't professional soldiers. They were probably just men who had decided to help protect their home from Urgles, pirates, brigands. We weren't going to lift a finger against them. I swear to you, Aragon. That was never part of our plan. I had no choice, though. They recognized me. I stabbed the white-haired man underneath his chin. It was like when father cut the throat of a pig. And then the other, I smashed open his skull. I can still feel his bones giving way. I remember every blow I've landed, from the soldiers in Carvajal to the ones on the burning plains. You know, when I close my eyes... Sometimes I can't sleep because the light from the fire we set in the docks of term is so bright in my mind. I think I'm going mad, then. Aragon found his hands gripping the staff with such force. His knuckles were white, and tendons ridged the insides of his wrists. Aye, he said. At first it was just Urgles. Then it was men and Urgles. And now this last battle. I know what we do is right, but right doesn't mean easy. Because of who we are... The Varden expects Saphira and me to stand at the front of their army and to slaughter entire battalions of soldiers. We do. We have. His voice caught, and he fell silent. Turmoil accompanies every great change, said Saphira to both of them. And we have experienced more than our share, for we are agents of that very change. I am a dragon, and I do not regret the deaths of those who endanger us. Killing of the guards... In Narda may not be a deed worthy of celebration, but neither is it one to feel guilty about. You had to do it. When you must fight, Roran, does not the fierce joy of combat lend wings to your feet? Do you not know the pleasure of pitting yourself against a worthy opponent, and the satisfaction of seeing the bodies of your enemies piled before you? Aragon, you have experienced this. Help me to explain it to your cousin. Aragon stared at the coals. She had stated a truth that he was reluctant to acknowledge, lest by agreeing that one can enjoy violence, he would become a man he would despise. So he was mute. Across from him, Roran appeared similarly affected. In a softer voice, Saphira said, Do not be angry. I did not intend to upset you. I forget sometimes that you are still unaccustomed to these emotions, while I have fought tooth and nail for survival since the day I hatched. Rising to his feet, Aragon walked to their saddlebags and retrieved the small earthenware jar Oric had given him before they parted, then poured two large mouthfuls of raspberry mead down his gullet. Warmth bloomed in his stomach. Grimacing, Aragon passed the jar to Roran, who also partook of the concoction. Several drinks later, when the mead had succeeded in tempering his black mood, Aragon said, "'We may have a problem tomorrow.' "'What do you mean?' Aragon directed his words towards Saphira as well. Remember how I said that we, Saphira and I, could easily handle the Razak? Aye. And so we can, said Saphira. Well, I was thinking about it while we spied on Helgrind, and I'm not so sure anymore. There are almost an infinite number of ways to do something with magic. For example, if I want to light a fire, I could light it with heat gathered from the air or the ground. I could create a flame out of pure energy. I could summon a bolt of lightning. I could concentrate a raft of sunbeams into a single point. I could use friction, and so forth. So? The problem is, 
even though I can devise numerous spells to perform this one action. Blocking those spells might require but what but a single counter spell. If you prevent the action from taking place, then you don't have to tailor your counter spell to address the unique properties of each individual spell. I still don't understand what this has to do with tomorrow. I do, said Sephira to both of them. She had immediately grasped the implications. It means that over the past century, Galvatorix may have placed wards around the Razak that will protect them against a whole range of spells. I probably won't be able to kill them with any of the words of death that was taught, nor any attacks that we can invent, invent now or then. We may have to rely. Stop! exclaimed Rorn. He gave a pained smile. Stop, please. My head hurts when you do that. Aragon paused with his mouth open. Until that moment, he had been unaware that he and Sephira were speaking in turn. The knowledge pleased him. It signified that they had achieved new heights of cooperation and were acting together as a single entity, which made them far more powerful than either would be on their own. It also troubled him when he contemplated how such a partnership must, by its very nature, reduce the individuality of those involved. He closed his mouth and chuckled. Sorry. What I'm worried about is this. If Galbatorix has had the foresight to take certain precautions, then force of arms may be the only means by which we can slay the Razak. If that's true, I'll just be in your way tomorrow. Nonsense. You may be slower than the Razak, but I have no doubt you'll give them cause to feel, fear your weapon, Roran Stronghammer. The compliment seemed to please Roran. The greatest danger for you is that the Razak or the Lether Blaka will manage to separate you from Sephira and me. The closer we stay together the safer we'll all be. Sephira and I will try to keep the Razak and Lether Blaka occupied, but some of them may slip past us. Four against two are only good odds if you're among the four. To Sephira, Aragon said, If I had a sword, I'm sure I could slay the Razak by myself, but I don't know if I can beat two cre creatures who are as quick as elves, using nothing but this staff. You were the one who insisted on carrying that dry twig instead of a proper weapon, she said. Remember, I told you it might not suffice against enemies as dangerous as the Razak. Aragon reluctantly conceded the point. If my spells fail us, we will be far more vulnerable than I expected. Tomorrow could end very, very badly indeed. Continuing the strain of conversation he had been privy to, Roran said, This magic is tricky business. The log he sat on gave a drawn-out groan as he rested his elbows on his knees. It is. Aragon agreed. The hardest part is trying to anticipate every possible spell. I spend most of my time asking how I can protect myself if I'm attacked like this, and would another magician expect me to do that? Could you make me as strong as fast as you are? Aragon considered the suggestion for several minutes before saying, I don't see how. The energy needed to do that would have to come from somewhere. Sephira and I could give it to you, but then we would lose as much speed or strength as you gained. What he did not mention was that one could also exa extract energy from nearby plants and animals, albeit at a terrible price. Namely, the, depths, the deaths of the smaller beings whose life force you drew upon. The technique was a great secret, and Aragon felt that he should not reveal it lightly, if at all. Moreover, it would be no use to Roran, as too little grew or lived on Hellgrind, to fuel a man's body. Then can you teach me magic? When Aragon hesitated, Roran added, Not now, of course. We don't have the time, and I don't expect one can become a magician overnight anyway. But in general, why not? You and I are cousins, we share much the same blood, and it would be a valuable skill to have. I don't know how someone who's not a writer learns to use magic, confessed Aragon. It's not something I studied. Glancing around, he plucked a flat, round stone from the ground and tossed it to Roran, who caught it backhand. Here. Try this. Concentrate on lifting the rock a foot or so into the air and say, Stenerisa. Stenerisa? Exactly. Roran frowned at the stone resting on his palm in a pose so reminiscent of Aragon's own training that Aragon could not help feeling a flash of nostalgia for the days he spent being drilled by Brahm. Roran's eyebrows met, his lips tightened into a snarl, and he growled, Stenerisa! With enough intensity... Aragon half expected the, the stone to fly out of sight. Nothing happened. Scowling even harder, Roran repeated his command. Stenerisa! 
The stone exhibited a profound lack of mov movement. Well, said Aragon, keep trying. That's the only advice I can give you. But, here he raised a finger, if you should happen to succeed, make sure you immediately come to me, or if I'm not around, another magician. You could kill yourself and others if you start experimenting with magic without understanding the rules. If nothing else, remember this. If you cast a spell that requires too much energy, you will die. Don't take on projects that are beyond your abilities. Don't try to bring back the dead. And don't try to unmake anything. Rorin nodded, still looking at the stone. Magic aside, I just realized there's something far more important you need to learn. Oh? Yes. You need to be able to hide your thoughts from the Black Hand, Duvangargata, and others like them. You know a lot of things now that could harm the Varden. It's crucial, then, that you master this skill as soon as we return. Until you can defend yourself from spies, neither Nasueda nor I nor anyone else can trust you with information that might help our enemies. I understand, but why did you include Duvangargata on that list? They serve you and Nasueda. They do, but even among our allies... There are more than a few people who would give their right arm, he grimaced at the appropriateness of the phrase, to ferret out our plans and secrets, and yours too, no doubt, no less. You have become a somebody, Rorin, partly because of your deeds, and partly because we're, we are related. I know, it is strange to be recognized by those you have not met. That it is. Several other related observations leaped to the tip of Aragon's tongue, but he resisted the urge to pursue the topic. It was a subject to explore another time. Now that you know what it feels like when one mind touches another, you might be able to learn to reach out and touch other minds in turn. I'm not sure that is an ability I want to have. No matter. You also might not be able to do it. Either way, before you spend time finding out, you should fir first devote yourself to the art of defense. His cousin cocked an eyebrow. How? Choose something. A sound, an image, an emotion anything, and let it swell within your mind until it blots out any other thoughts. That's all? It's not as easy as you think. Go on, take a stab at it. When you're ready, let me know, and I'll see how well you've done. Several moments passed. Then, at a flick of Rorin's fingers, Aragon launched his consciousness toward his cousin, eager to discover what he had accomplished. The full strength of Aragon's mental ray rammed into a wall composed of Rorin's memories of Katrina, and was stopped. He could take no ground, find no entrance or purchase, nor undermine the impenetrable barrier that stood before him. At that instant, Rorin's entire identity was based upon his feelings for Katrina. His defenses exceeded any Aragon had previously encountered, for Rorin's mind was devoid of anything else Aragon could grasp hold of and use to gain control over his cousin. Then Rorin shifted his left leg, and the wood underneath released a harsh squeal. With that, the wall Aragon had hurled himself against fractured into dozens of pieces as a host of competing thoughts distracted Rorin. What was? Blast. Don't pay attention to it. He'll blow, break through. Katrina. Remember Katrina. Ignore Aragon. The night she agreed to marry me. The smell of the grass in her hair. Is that him? No. Focus. Don't. Taking advantage of Rorin's confusion, Aragon rushed forward and by the force of his will immobilized Rorin before he could shield himself again. You understand the basic concept, said Aragon, then withdrew from Rorin's mind and said out loud, But you have to learn to maintain your concentration, even when you're in the middle of a battle. You must learn to think without thinking. To empty yourself of all hopes and worries, save that one idea that is your harmer. Something the elves taught me, which I have found helpful, is to recite a riddle or a piece of a poem or song. Having an action that you can repeat over and over again makes it much easier to keep your mind from straying. I'll work on it, promised Rorin. In a quiet voice, Aragon said, You really love her, don't you? It was more a statement of truth and wonder than a question, the answer being self-evident, and one he felt uncertain making. Romance was not a topic Aragon had broached with his cousin before, notwithstanding the many hours they had devoted in years past to debating the relative merits of the young women in and around Carvajal. How did it happen? I liked her. She liked me. What importance are the details? Come now, said Aragon. I was too angry to ask before you left for Therensford, and we have not seen each other again until just four days ago. I'm curious. The skin around Rorin's eyes pulled and wrinkled as he rubbed his temples. 
There's not much to tell. I've always been partial to her. It meant little before I was a man, but after my rites of passage, I began to wonder whom I would marry and whom I wanted to become the mother of my children. During one of our visits to Carvajal, I saw Katrina stop by the side of Loring's house to pick a moss rose growing in the shade of the eaves. She smiled as she looked at the flower. It was such a tender smile, and so happy, I decided right then that I wanted to make her smile like that again and again, and that I wanted to look at that smile until the day I died. Tears gleamed in Roran's eyes, but they did not fall, and a second later, he blinked and they vanished. I fear I have failed in that regard. After a respectful pause, Aragon said, You courted her, then? Aside from using me to ferry compliments to Katrina, how else did you proceed? You ask like one who seeks instruction. I did not. You're imagining. Come now, yourself, said Roran. I know when you're lying. You get that big, foolish grin, and your ears turn red. The elves may have given you a new face, but that part of you hasn't changed. What is it that exists between you and Arya? The strength of Roran's perception disturbed Aragon. Nothing. The moon has addled your brain. Be honest. You dote upon her words as if each one were a diamond, and your gaze lingers upon her as if you were starving, and she a grand feast, arrayed an inch beyond your reach. A plume of dark gray smoke erupted from Saphir's nostrils as she made a choking-like noise. Aragon ignored her suppressed merriment and said, Arya is an elf. I'm very beautiful. Pointed ears and slanted eyes are small flaws when compared with her charms. You look like a cat yourself now. Arya is over a hundred years old. That particular piece of information caught Roran by surprise. His eyebrows went up and he said, I find that hard to believe. She's in the prime of her youth. It's true. Well, be as it may, these are reasons you give me, Aragon, and the heart rarely listens to reason. Do you fancy her or not? If he fancied her any more, said Saphira to both Aragon and Roran, I'd be trying to kiss Arya myself. Saphira! Mortified, Aragon swatted her on the leg. Roran was prudent enough not to rib Aragon further. Then answer my original question, and tell me how things stand between you and Arya. Have you spoken to her or her family about this? I fa found it unwise to let such matters fester. Aye, said Aragon, and stared at the length of polished hawthorn. I spoke with her. To what end? When Aragon did not immediately reply, Roran uttered a frustrated exclamation. Getting answers out of you is harder than dragging Berka through the mud. Aragon chuckled at the mention of Berka, one of their draft horses. Safira, will you solve this puzzle for me? Otherwise, I fear I'll never get a full explanation. To no end. No end at all. She'll not have me. Aragon spoke dispassionately, as if commenting on a stranger's misfortune, but with him, within him raged a torrent of hurt so deep and wild he felt Safira withdraw somewhat from him. I'm sorry, said Roran. Aragon forced a swallow past the lump in his throat, past the bruise that was in his heart, and down to the knotted skein of his stomach. It happens. I know it may seem unlikely at the moment, said Warren, but I'm sure you will meet another woman who will make you forget this, Arya. There are countless maids, and more than a few married women, I'd say, wager. It would be delighted to catch the eye of a rider. You'll have no trouble finding a wife among all the lovelies in Allegasia. And what would you have done if Katrina rejected your suit? The question struck Roran dumb. It was obvious he could not imagine how he might have reacted. Aragon continued. Con contrary to what you, Arya, and everyone else seem to believe, I am aware that other eligible women exist in Allegasia, and that people have been known to fall in love more than once. No doubt, if I spent my days in the company of ladies from King Oren's court, I might indeed decide that I fancy one. However... My path is not so easy as that, regardless of whether I can shift my affections to another, and the heart, as you observed, is a notoriously fickle beast. The question remains, should I? Your tongue has grown as twisted as the roots of a fir tree, said Warren. Speak not in riddles. Very well. What human woman can begin to understand who or what I am, or the extent of my powers? Who could share in my life? Few enough, and all of them magicians. And of that select group, or even of women in general, how many are immortal? Roran laughed, 
a rough, hearty bellow that rang loud in the gulch. You might as well ask for the sun in your pocket, or... He stopped and tensed as if he were about to spring forward, and then became unnaturally still. You cannot be. I am. Vern struggled to find words. Is it a result of your change in Elasmira, or is it part of being a writer? Part of being a writer. That explains why Galbatorix hasn't died. I. The branch Vern had added to the fire burst asunder with a muted pop as the coals underneath heated the gnarled length of wood to the point where a small catch of water or sap that had somehow evaded the rays of the sun for untold decades exploded into steam. The idea is so... Vast, it's almost inconceivable, said Rowan. Death is part of who we are. It guides us. It shapes us. It drives us to madness. Can you still be human if you have no mortal end? I'm not invincible, Aragon pointed out. I can still be killed with a sword or an arrow, and I can still catch some incurable disease. But if you avoid those dangers, you will live forever. If I do, then yes, Safira and I will endure. It seems both a blessing and a curse. I, I cannot in good conscience marry a woman who will age and die while I remain untouched by time. Such an experience would be equally cruel for both of us. On top of that, I find the thought of taking one wife after another throughout the long centuries rather depressing. Can you make someone immortal with magic? asked Rorin. You can darken white hair, you can smooth wrinkles and remove cataracts, and if you are willing to go to extraordinary lengths, you can give a six-year-old man the body he had at nineteen. However, the elves have never discovered a way to restore a person's mind without destroying his or her memories. And who wants to erase their identity every so many decades in exchange for immortality? It would be a stranger, then, who lived on. An old brain and a young body isn't the answer, either. For even with the best of health, that which we humans are made of can only last for a century, perhaps a bit more. Nor can you just stop someone from aging. That causes a host of other problems. Oh, elves and men have tried a thousand and one different ways to foil death, but none have proved successful. In other words, said Rorn, it's safer for you to love Arya than to leave your heart free for the taking by a human woman. Who else can I marry but an elf, especially considering how I look now? Aragon quelled the desire to reach up and finger the curved tips of his ears a habit he had fallen into. When I lived in Elismira, it was easy for me to accept how the dragons had changed my appearance. After all, they gave me many gifts besides. Also, the elves were friendlier to me after the Agate Bloodrun. It was only when I rejoined the Varden that I realized how different I've become. It bothers me, too. I'm no longer just human, and I'm not quite an elf. I'm something else in between. A mix. A half-breed. Cheer up, said Rorin. You may not have to worry about living forever. Galvatorix, Murtag, the Razak, or even one of the Empire's soldiers could put steel through us at any moment. A wise man would ignore the future and drink and carouse while he still has the opportunity to enjoy this world. I know what Father would say to that. And he'd give us a good hiding to boot. They shared a laugh, and then the silence that so often intruded on their discussion asserted itself once again a gap born of equal parts weariness, familiarity, and, conversely, the many differences that fate had created between those who had once gone about lives that were but variations on a single melody. "'You should sleep,' said Sephira to Aragon and Rorin. "'It's late, and we must rise early tomorrow.' Aragon looked at the black vault of the sky, judging the hour by how far the stars had rotated. The night was older than he had expected. "'Sound advice,' he said. I just wish we had a few more days to rest before we storm Helgrind. The battle on the burning plains drained all of Saphira's strength and my own, and we have not fully recovered, what with flying here and the energy I had transferred into the belt of Bloth the Wise these past two evenings. My limbs still ache, and I have more bruises than I can count. Look. Loosening the ties on the cuff of his left shirt sleeve, he pushed back the soft lemere, a fabric the elves made by cross-weaving wool and nettle threads, revealing a rancid yellow streak where his shield had mashed against his forearm. Ha! said Rorin. You call that tiny little mark a bruise? I hurt myself worse this morning when I bumped my toe. Here, I'll show you a bruise a man can be proud of. He unlaced his left boot, pulled it off, 
and rolled up the leg of his trousers to expose a black stripe as wide as Aragon's thumb that slanted across his quadriceps. I caught the haft of a spear as a soldier was turning about. Impressive, but I have even better. Ducking out of his tunic, Aragon yanked his shirt free of his trousers and twisted to the side so that Roran could see the large blotch on his ribs and the similar discoloration on his belly. Arrows, he explained. Then he uncovered his right forearm, revealing a bruise that matched the one on his other arm, given when he had deflected a sword with his bracer. Now Roran bared a con collection of irregular blue-green spots, each the side of a gold coin, that marched from his left armpit down to the base of his spine, the result of having fallen upon a jumble of rocks and embossed armor. Aragon inspected the lesions, then chuckled and said, Psha, those are pinpricks. Did you get lost and run into a rose bush? I have one that puts those to shame. He removed both his boots, then stood and dropped his trousers, so that his only garb was his shirt and woolen underpants. Top that if you can, and pointed to the inside of his thighs. A riotous combination of colors mottled his skin, as if Aragon were an exotic fruit that was ripening in uneven patches from crabapple green to putrefied purple. Ouch, said Roran. What happened? I jumped off Sephira when we were fighting Murtag and Thorn in the air. That's how I wounded Thorn. Sephira managed to dive under me and catch me before I hit the ground. But I landed on her back a bit harder than I wanted to. Roran winced and shivered at the same time. Does it go all the way? He trailed off and made a vague gest gesture upward. Unfortunately. I have to admit, that's a remarkable bruise. You should be proud. It's quite a feat to get injured in the manner you did, and in that particular place. I'm glad you appreciate it. Well, said Ron, you may have the biggest bruise, but the Razak dealt me a wound the likes of which you cannot match, since the dragons, as I understand, removed the scar from your back. While he spoke, he divested himself of his shirt and moved farther into the pulsing light of the coals. Aragon's eyes widened before he caught himself and concealed his shock behind a more neutral expression. He berated himself for overreacting, thinking, It can't be that bad. But the longer he studied Roran, the more dismayed he became. A long, puckered scar, red and glossy, wrapped around Roran's right shoulder, starting at his collarbone and ending just past the middle of his arm. It was obvious that the Razak had severed part of the muscle, and that the two ends had failed to heal back together for an unsightly bulge deformed the skin below the scar, where the underlying fibers had recoiled upon themselves. Farther up, the skin had sunk inward, forming a depression half an inch deep. Roran, You should have shown this to me days ago. I had no idea the Razak hurt you so badly. Do you have any difficulty moving your arm? Not to the side or back, said Roran. He demonstrated. But in the front, I can only lift my hand about as high as... mid-chest. Grimacing. He lowered his arm. Even that's a struggle. I have to keep my thumb level, or else my arm goes dead. The best way I've found is to swing my arm around from behind and let it land on whatever I'm trying to grasp. I skinned my knuckles a few times before I mastered the trick. Aragon twisted the staff between his hands. Should I? He asked Sephira. I think you must. We may regret it tomorrow. You will have more cause for regret if Roran dies because he could not wield his hammer when the occasion demanded. If you draw upon the resources around us, you can avoid tiring yourself further. You know I hate doing that. Even talking about it sickens me. Our lives are more important than an ant's, Sifir countered. Not to an ant. And are you an ant? Don't be glib, Aragon. It ill becomes you. With a sigh, Aragon put down the staff and beckoned to Roran. Here, I'll heal that for you. You can do that? Obviously. A momentary surge of excitement brightened Roran's face, but then he hesitated and looked trouble. Now? Is that wise? As Sephira said, better I tend to you while I have the chance, lest your injury cost you your life or endanger the rest of us. Roran drew near, and Aragon placed his right hand over the red scar, while at the same time expanding his consciousness to encompass the trees and the plants and the animals that populated the gulch, save those he feared were too weak to survive his spell. Then Aragon began to chant in the ancient language. The incantation he recited was long and complex. Repairing such a wound went far beyond growing new skin, and was a difficult matter at best. 
In this, Aragon relied upon the curative formulas that he had studied in Elismira and had devoted so many weeks to memorizing. The silvery mark on Aragon's palm, the good way Ignazia, glowed white hot as he released the magic. A second later, he uttered an involuntary groan as he died three times, once each with two small birds roosting in a nearby juniper, and also with a snake hidden among the rocks. Across from him, Roran threw back his head and bared his teeth in a soundless howl as his shoulder muscle jumped and writhed beneath the surface of his shifting skin. Then it was over. Aragon inhaled a shuddering breath and rested his head in his hands, taking advantage of the concealment they provided to wipe away his tears before he examined the fruit results of his labor. He saw Roran shrug several times and then stretch and windmill his arms. Roran's shoulder was large and round, the results of years spent digging holes for fence posts, hauling rocks, and pitching hay. Despite himself, a needle of envy pricked Aragon. He might be stronger, but he had never been as muscular as his cousin. Roran grinned. It's as good as ever. Better, maybe. Thank you. You're welcome. It was the strangest thing. I actually felt as if I was going to crawl out of my hide, and it itched something terrible. I could barely keep from ripping. Give me some bread from your saddlebag, would you? I'm hungry. We just had dinner. I need a bite to eat after using magic like that. Aragon sniffed and then pulled out his kerchief and wiped his nose. He sniffed again. What he had said was not quite true. It was the toll his spell had exacted on the wildlife that disturbed him, not the magic itself. And he feared he might throw up unless he had something to settle his stomach. You're not ill, are you? asked Roran. No. With the memory of the deaths he had caused still heavy in his mind, Aragon reached for the jar of mead by his side, hoping to fend off a tide of morbid thoughts. Something very large, heavy, and sharp struck his hand and pinned it against the ground. He winced and looked over to see the tip of one of Saphira's ivory claws digging into his flesh. Her thick eyelid went snick as it flashed across the great, big, glittering iris she fixed upon him. After a long moment, she lifted the claw, as a person would a finger, and Aragon withdrew his hand. He gulped and gripped the hawthorn staff once more, striving to ignore the mead and to concentrate upon what was immediate and tangible, instead of wallowing in dismal introspection. Roran removed a ragged half of sourdough bread from his bags, then paused, and with a hint of a smile, said, "'Wouldn't you rather have some venison? I didn't finish all of mine.' He held out the makeshift spit of seared juniper wood, on which were impaled three clumps of golden brown meat. To Aragon's sensitive nose, the odor that wafted toward him was thick and pungent, and reminded him of nights when he had spent in the spine, and of long winter dinners where he, Roran, and Garrow had gathered around their stove and enjoyed each other's company while a blizzard hollowed out, howled outside. His mouth watered. It's so warm, said Roran, and waved the venison in front of Aragon. With an effort of will, Aragon shook his head. Just give me the bread. Are you sure? It's perfect. Not too tough, not too tender, and cooked with the perfect amount of seasoning. It's so juicy, when you take a bite, it's as if you swallowed a mouthful of Elaine's best stew. No, I can't. You know you'll like it. Roran, stop teasing me and hand over that bread. Ah, now see, you look better already. Maybe what you need isn't bread, but someone to get your hackles up, eh? Aragon glowered at him. Then, faster than the eye could see, snatched the bread away from Roran. That seemed to amuse Roran even more. As Aragon tore at the loaf, he said, I don't know how you can survive on nothing but fruit, bread, and vegetables. A man has to eat meat if he wants to keep his strength up. Don't you miss it? More than you can imagine. Then why do you insist on torturing yourself like this? Every creature in this world has to eat other living beings, even if they are only plants, in order to survive. That is how we are made. Why attempt to defy the natural order of things? I said much the same in Elzmira, observed Sephira, but he did not listen to me. Aragon shrugged. We already had this discussion. You do what you want. I won't tell you or anyone else how to live. However, I cannot in good conscience eat a beast whose thoughts I've, and feelings I've shared. The tip of Sephira's tail twitched, and her scales clinked against the warm, a worn dome of rock that protruded from the ground. Oh, he's hopeless. Lifting and extending her neck, Sphira nipped the venison, spit and all, from Roran's other hand. 
The wood cracked between her serrated teeth as she bit down. Then it and the meat vanished into the fiery depths of her belly. Mmm, you did not exaggerate, she said to Roran. What a sweet and succulent morsel. So soft, so salty, so deliciously delectable. It makes me want to wiggle with delight. You should cook for me more often, Roran Stronghammer. Only next time, I think you should prepare several deer at once. Otherwise, I won't get a proper meal. Roran hesitated, as if unable to decide whether her request was serious, and, if so, how he could politely extricate himself from such an unlooked-for and rather onerous obligation. He cast a pleading glance at Aragon, who burst out laughing, both at Roran's expression and at his predicament. The rise and fall of Sephira's sonorous laugh joined with Aragon's and reverberated throughout the hollow. Her teeth gleamed matter red in the light from the embers. An hour after the three of them had retired, Aragon was lying on his back alongside Sephira, muffled in layers of blankets against the night cold. All was still and quiet. It seemed as if a magician had placed an enchantment upon the earth, and that everything in the world was bound in an eternal sleep and would remain frozen and unchanging forevermore underneath the watchful gaze of the twinkling stars. Without moving, Aragon whispered in his mind, Sephira, yes, little one? What if I'm right and he's in Helgrind? I don't know what I should do then. Tell me what I should do. I cannot, little one. This is a decision you have to make by yourself. The ways of men are not the ways of dragons. I would tear off his head and feast on his body, but that would be wrong for you, I think. Will you stand by me, whatever I decide? Always, little one. Now rest. All will be well. Comforted, Aragon gazed into the void between the stars and slowed his breathing as he drifted into, this, into the trance that had replaced sleep for him. He remained conscious of his surroundings, but against the backdrop of the white constellations, the figures of his waking dreams strode forth and performed confused and shadowy plays, as was their wont.